Hello and welcome. This is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to Data Import Manager number nine. We now have the ability to add recurring imports to each import. Each come with their own ability to be active or inactive. We also have the ability to reoccur those imports every day, week, month, quarter, or year at any frequency. We've got a lot to show you, including this amazing little fade out button. So let's get started. All right, thanks again for joining us on this part nine. I've got uh, this last part nine. Actually, we've got one more part 10. We're gonna be a 10 part series. We're gonna go over the reoccurring and whatever we don't get to. We'll get to in part 10, we're include a cleanup. We're gonna add a log in part 10. We're gonna add additional features so that we can have this data import manager run fully automated hands-free while you sleep at any frequency at any template. So there's so much I gotta show you in these last two trainings. So we're going to try and get to it all. Make sure you're checking every single episode. If you have not subscribed, please do so now. And you can also click the notification icon bell so that you get alerted for each and every brand new, unique, amazing training video every Tuesday right here for you. If you appreciate these videos, uh, we appreciate you being here. So thanks so much. Uh, have some amazing products to go over if you would like to get 100 of these Excel workbooks for just $37, you can. There's some links below. That'll help us out and get you 100 of these delivered right to you in a single zip file. That's an amazing product. And also, if you love learning Excel, we have the Ultimate Excel Resource Guide. That's over 1,000 Excel resources, including 100 downloadable PDFs, 100 utilities and add-ons, 100 listings of free courses, 100 paid courses, and a ton more. Over 1,000 there so be sure and get that and of course the amazing dashboard master class we've got that uh, a $50 discount right now depending upon when you're looking for the video at this time we have it so keep that in mind it may not be there forever so you might want to check that out all right let's get started on this training we've got a lot to show you I've got the ability to add now reoccurring now we have this little fade out button. It's a slide fade out button. If you look here, it automatically hides or displays the reoccurring. The reoccurring section has the ability to be active or inactive. We have also added a feature called import reoccurs every. We can have this too. We can have it every day, week, month, quarter, or year. So we have a lot of different to add in recurring at almost any type of frequency. We can set the recurring at a specific date and then it'll uh, track when it was last run and it'll do a specific time and that way we can get this on fully automated we've added a brand new recurring imports recurring imports table here and that's going to track our recurring number it tracks our template number which template when it was created a status so that way you can turn off a recurring or turn it on simply by changing this to active or inactive only active recurring will be run so you can always turn it off temporarily and then turn it back on it'll save all the savings so we've got some really cool conditional formatting we're going to show you both for the active and inactive and both for the uh, Im recurring import or non import so we're going to show that to you I'm also going to go over we're going to do an advanced filter based on some fixed criteria here on the status of active and scheduled for a lesson or equal to current date and time and we've got a result so we're going to go over a lot of that we've got a lot to cover so make sure you get your coffee or tea or your beverage of choice and uh, stick with me it's going to be a fantastic training whatever we don't get into this we're going to get into our last part part 10 we will cover i also want to add an import log haven't added anything on that yet but i'm going to cover that last time because i want to know what was imported and when and i want to have a listing so that we're going to do in part 10 the import log so make sure you catch the very last episode and then uh, this application will be ready to go so you can automate your imports as many imports as you want there's lots of unlimited all right let's get to it the first really cool feature we've got here is this slide button and it's actually a fade out it's a little bit fast i wanted to make it a little bit slower in fact if you select any kind of uh, shape it runs a little bit slower so when you see this you see it's got a really fade out it goes from gray to green and green to gray it's a little bit slower now when we select shapes it's got a excel's got to work a little bit
little bit harder because we now have a selected shape. So that tends to put a little bit of more calculations and more things. So it runs slower, just so you keep in mind. Uh, I couldn't really get it to run like in the middle. So it runs, I wanted to run it a little bit slower, but it seems to be pretty good now, even with a weight now. We're going to go over how we did that. So you can see it's a really cool feature. I'd love for you to teach you this feature. It starts out in gray and it goes to green. Now, opposed to just changing the color, it actually changes slowly as it's going and you can do this with any color I'll show you how we arrived at that fade it's actually a fade effect from one color to the next so as we're changing it it slowly fades from green to gray and slowly fades from gray to green so it's a really cool effect can't wait to show it to you I've never taught that before so I'd really love to teach you that it's a great this switch something like this you've seen in an inventory the switch itself from moving side to side but I've made that a little bit better I've improved that improved upon that from the last time I showed that to you. That was actually over a year ago in an inventory. You may remember a switch similar to this. All right, so we've got that. Let's get started on the training. And the first thing we want to do is we have added some additional settings here in our panel here, our admin panel. We have the current date, which is just simply today. I want to keep track of the current date. I want that in a cell. Whether it's reoccurring or not, that's true. When we change this to false, you're going to see this disappear. That's conditional formatting. Based back on true, it's going to go back. So when we change this switch, this B167 is going to change from true to false and false to true. So that's how we're going to use conditional formatting. We're going to go over that conditional formatting in just a moment. I want to know what reoccurring number we're on. Now we're tracking reoccurrings, right? We're as many as we want, but each recurring has their own unique value, just like we did last time on templates. Templates have their last own value. So recurrings have their own value, and we incrementally add one each time. So every time there's a brand new recurring, it's going to add three, four, five, and so on, so forth. So we want to keep track of the recurring number, and I also want to know what row the recurring number is on. We've added two different dynamic named range, just as we did last week with the import templates. Very much the same. There's no difference. You, you understand the methodology to my madness of programming here, as you've seen a few trainings. So I've got really two brand, just two specific dynamic named ranges in this recurring number and recurring template number. So if we tab over to recurring number, we're going to see that this is an offset and it's going to contain just the two rows of data, four and five. As this, as the list grows, so will our name range. So that's called recurring number. And I also want to track the template numbers in here. Template numbers are here in column B, that as well as dynamic too template. We've been over this formula many times. Make sure you download the workbook. It's free. You can take a look at this. Uh, the links are in the description, uh, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or LinkedIn or wherever you're seeing this video. You can always get the links, whether it's through email or your Facebook Messenger. Absolutely free. Just go ahead and click on the links and we'll send that right over to you. So I do appreciate you downloading this. I create these for you because I want to make you better with Excel. And I want to see you create your own applications and get ink from those as opposed to getting in the freelance rut where you're doing jobs and making money and then spending money. I want to see you develop your own applications to get that recurring income, passive recurring, whether you're working, sleeping, or on vacation. And that's exactly why I am creating the Excel for Freelancers mentorship program where I'm going to take you step by step through that program all the way from defining your applications to uh, designing your applications, developing your applications, and actually deploying your applications. All 12 steps we're going to cover in a 12-step program there. We're going to teach you every step in the mentorship program coming up soon. So we're going to teach you all of that. So that's why I want to get you into developing these applications so you can sell and market them. Uh, so we've got these two named ranges here. And so we're going to use those in the formulas here. So you'll see our named ranges start on row four. So if I want to find a uh, the recurring number one or number two, I'm going to add three to that because if I find the second one, it's going to show me two. The second one, one, two. But if I want the row number, I need to add three. That's just what we've done right here in this formula, recurring row. We're going to match B168. B168 is the recurring number. In this case, it's two. We're going to look it up in a named range called recurring number. I just showed you that. We want an exact match, so that's zero. And then we're going to add three because we want the row number. I don't want the 
where it's matched, which would be two, I want the row number, which is five. If there's any error or it's not found, we're gonna, it's gonna return a blank. So that's a, some, a very similar that you see me use lots of times. We've got the next import on. This is the field that gets populated with VBA. It's gonna take whatever the user changes here, 310, and it's gonna automatically add that here. So that's gonna help us, and I'll show you how that comes into play. And then what I wanna do is I want to take this next import row, I wanna take this information from here, and I wanna populate it here. Now I could populate it here, but I wanna keep the time separate, but I wanna combine them here. So in this formula here, I've done just that. We're gonna use the text formula. First of all, if B172, which is the date, the next import date, and I'll show you, all in VBA, all I do is take any change here, and I put it into B172, so it's automatically copied over. As long as it's not blank here, I wanna take that date, and I wanna put it in here, and I wanna format the date using the text, using here text. We're gonna, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add B172 and J170, excuse me, I170. When we're having a time and a date in Excel, the date is a whole number, the time is in decimal. So when you add those two together, you get both the date and the time. So that's just what we're doing here. We're adding the date and the time together here, and then we're gonna format it. You can change your formats to whatever you want. You may use military time, so you would not wanna use this. You may wanna use uh, HHMM, which would be military time, and then just get rid of the AM, PM. That's fine too, you, know, you can change it to whatever format you want. So I've just changed it here. So DDD, the four Ds me, means the full day name. If I was to change this to uh, 3Ds, it would show something a little bit different. Take a look at that, that would just be the abbreviation Sunday. You can do that too. Gives you an idea of the different things you can do with format. The same thing with month. If we remove one M, it's gonna give us the abbreviated month with just the three letters. So you can play with the formats a lot here and see just whichever one you prefer. Then I have the, so the, then I have the day number, the year, and I wanted this format because I like it. Then I've added the word at in here because I like that. I like the way that it looks at because it's a nice full sentence. And then we're going to use H, M, M, A, M, P, M. So that's going to get us this nice text. And I've done the same thing with the last import. The last import, this is going to load up right here. And this one includes the date and the time. This one includes the date and time. So we're going to show you how VBA loads it. Basically, all I'm doing is I'm going to take the last run right here. And I'm gonna, when we're loading this information, we're gonna bring this value, 9.3, 2.47 p.m., I'm gonna bring it right in here, 9.3. In fact, this one's showing military time, actually. But uh, here, in this, in this particular cell, but on here, we're showing it as uh, a.m. p.m., which is fine. No problem, I just wanted to display here consistently. So that's all, so these are fixed. VBA doesn't add those, those are based on whatever the values are here and here. And I also wanna know what the reoccurring row, the template number, based on the template number. So when I add N3, what is N3? N3, if you remember, is our template number. We have multiple templates here. So when we change a template number, that, that template number automatically is gonna change right here. So what I want to know is I wanna look up the row based on the template. So here, let's go back to the import summary here. So what I wanna know is I wanna know the row, which is the same row as here, but I wanna row this row based on the template number. That'll come in handy a little bit later on. So we're gonna look up the same row, row five, but one, one is based on the reoccurring number, one is based on the template number. These may be different. Right now they're the same, but they could easily be different. So they're not really coincidental there. So two, what I wanna do is I wanna look up this row five based on the template number. So if I add a different template, so if I change this to one, it's gonna change, it's going to change this to four here automatically. So it's gonna look up, looking up that template number and finding the row. That'll come and I'll show you how that comes in handy, but I wanted to under, you to understand the formulas based on, on that. So that's really all the formulas we have here. So that's gonna really help us. Let's take a look at this fade out. I don't know how much we're gonna to get to now, but fade out. So we're gonna use RGB colors, RGB. Now, if you're familiar with RGB, Basically, when we do an RGB, we can get RGB values for any color we want, and this fill color is a solid fill color, 
And when you click more colors, you're going to see we have an RGB here, 184, 184, 184. That is the gray, gray. That's the gray. And what about the green? Well, the green, we have another one. Let's switch this. You see how it changes. Now the green, when we format the shape and have a look at the fill, we're going to see that the fill on this has an RGB of uh, 0, 222, 26. 0, 222, 26. Now I've put those RGBs right here just so you can see the green RGB and the gray RGB. So basically what I want to do, if it's green, I want to move it from green to gray. And I want to change these RGBs. So if I'm going to change, if it's gr currently gray, if it's currently green, which it is now, and I want to move it to gray, what do I need to do? Well, I need to take this zero and I need to make it to 184. I need to take this 222 and I need to make it to 184. So I need to reduce it. I need to take this 26. Remember, we're going gradual, right? So it's not just a simple change. I mean, it is, but but what I want to do is I want to increment, you know, I want to go from 26 to 27, or I want to increment to a certain level from 26 to 184. So I want to go because I want the fade out effect. If we were to stop this midway through, we would see it was kind of be kind of a uh, different color, although I can't quite stop it midway through unless I pause break it really quickly, but probably won't do that. So, but you'll, I'll show you the idea. So the idea is to gradually go from this RGB to this or from this RGB back to this. So we can use increments. So how would we do that? Well, let's, let's, let's take a step back and take a look at the macro. Before we get back into the colors, let's take a look at the macro on how we see this. What I want to do is I want to shift this to the right or shift it to the left. And so let's take a look at how we do that into the developers. And if we right click, let's right click and click assign macro. We'll see that the macro that's been assigned already to this is called reoccurring switch, reoccurring switch. So take a look at that and find that macro inside our Visual Basic Alt F11. And you'll see we have a module called reoccurring macros now, reoccurring macros. And if we look up here, we have a macro called reoccurring switch. So this is the macro that we're going to run. Now I've figured it out. Let me just show you how I figured it out. I'm going to go into how I figured it out. So we have a certain position. Let's just run a little test macro here. We've got a little bit of a test macro here. We can get rid of that. Okay, so what I want to know is sheet one dot shapes. Let's do a message box. Message box sheet one shapes. And what is the shape I want to use? Well, the shape that I want to use, this shape is called switch front. I want to know where that is now. I want, I want to know where, what position it is now. So let's say you're, you're trying to figure this out and you manually move it exactly where you want it, right? You have it exactly where you want it. Let's say it's right about here. And you, so now you want to know the left position of it because you, you know it. So all we do need to find the left position, switch front what is the left position dot left I want to know what the left position is so we're gonna run that and let's run it and it's gonna tell us it's 601 601 is the left position okay so we know it's 601 now what if I move it to where I really want let's say I manually move this right to where I want right to where I want it to be on the other one Oh, I just moved it <laughs> I just clicked the macro okay so now it's where I wanted to move it but now where is it Let's run the macro again. So it was 601 before. Now let's run it. And now we see it's 634. 634. It's actually moved a little bit too much to the left, but I figured it out as 32. So the difference is 32, exactly right where I want it. So if we move it 32 back to the left, it's going to be 601. And if we move it to the right, it's going to be 633 in actuality, 633, because I think it's moved a little bit. But you get the idea. So I figured out it's 32 pixels, one way or the other way. So we're going to do duct 32 pixels from the left or increase it. So that's how we can easily figure it out just based on this, something like this. So we know we've got to move it to 32, right? So now we know how we do that. So we can set up a for next loop, something like for move button equals zero to 32. So we can use that to increase because we want to create a slide out, a sliding effect, but how many pixels? Now we know it's 32 pixels, so we determine that. So let's step through this macro and see how we go. If this is true, then we know it's a currently reoccurring and we need to make it false. But if it's currently false, we need to make it true. So we need to determine what position it's currently in 
based on this true or false, based on this true or false. And another thing I want to do is, is sometimes every once in a while things get out of whack, right? Maybe because of the shapes or something. So I want to set it up so that automatically it's going to move back into the right position, which is really, really cool. I'll show you how we do that. So no matter where I move this to, no matter where I move it, if I click this macro, there's a macro, the same macro has been assigned to this. If I click this, it's always going to move back to the right position. So I want to show you how we did that. And the good thing is, is when we move this background, let's say we want to move the background here. Again, it's always going to move back to the right position. So I can't wait to show that to you. That's pretty cool. So no matter where we move the background, it's going to keep Let's put it back where it belongs. So as long as I keep it, it's going to move right back to the right position. So I'm going to show you how we did that. OK, so back into it. We know we need to base it left or right based on the value of B167. So let's step back into the macro and take a look at B167. If B167 is true, then we know it's currently reoccurring. So we need to set it to false. So the first thing we're going to do is set B167 to false. And I also want to make G168 inactive. I just want to set this to inactive here, although you can't see it now. So there we go. So now we see it's inactive. It's inactive. So because I want to make sure that if they turn it off, it automatically goes to inactive so we can update it. That's, so that's what I've done there. Let's set it to inactive. So we're going to do that. So if, if I make it active and we can continue working on it, but if I make it turn it off and turn it back on, you're going to see it's inactive again. So it turns itself on. That's, you can change that if you don't want that. But what happens is I want to make sure that as soon as they turn it off, this inactive gets saved right here. I want to make sure when they turn it off that it stays inactive. That's very important because turning it off makes it inactive. So we just we don't want it to run recurring if, it's, if the user has decided that there it's going to make it a one-time import and not a reoccurring import okay moving on so that's why we make it inactive we're ready for the loop this is the loop so i've added two wait nows and now strangely enough and maybe someone can tell me why i don't quite understand it if i change this to just one tenth of a second more it's going to run super slow oh you can watch the fade out let's let's let me talk through it while you're watching the fade out now watch as this goes to green so i've made it super slow so i've doubled i just increased it one it doesn't seem to really do very very well when it's increasing just a slight so i'm i kept it at five or under but here is a slow motion as i talk through this you can see it slowly changes to gray and that's really the effect i want of course we're going to have it much faster but you'll see it changes from green to gray and it's a really cool fade out effect and uh, you can play with it and see how different so now it's completely gray so 0.6 seconds seems to be way too much for that 0.5 worked just fine. So keep that in mind. And I've actually doubled these up. Doubling it up seems to make it run a little bit slower. You can add more if you want to make it slower. So I've doubled these up. It makes it a little bit slower. But I couldn't find something in between 5 point. It didn't, any other, even this didn't really have an effect on it either. So if you'll see, it didn't really, it doesn't have any effect on it. All right, moving on. So we have a wait now. That's going to slow things down in part of our loop. And I want to make the switch front increment left minus one. So we're going to use minus one each time, deducting, deducting, deducting. So increment left minus one. So when we're here, it's going to go one more, one more, 32 times. It's going to keep going pixel by pixel to the left. So I think that's kind of standard, just going to subtract one to whatever its current position is. Now here comes the cool math. Okay, so we know we have to get if it's green we know we have to get it to gray so here we go if it's green and we have to do it based on 32 remember we have 32 chances to reduce it and reduce it and reduce it so that means i have to get if it's currently green i have to go from zero to 184 and i have to do it in 32 times so gradual so how are we going to do that well that is the red this is the red this is the green and this is the blue. So red, green, and blue. So the red needs to increase 184. The green needs to decrease 38. And the blue needs to increase 158. So how do we get the red to increase 184 32 different times? It's simple math. If we divide 184 divided by 32, we get 5.75 so that means if i add 5.75 32 times we're going to start out at zero and we're going to get to 184 so all, every time it moves one pixel we're going to increase the red by 5.75 and now 
the green, the green, what is the green? The green's gonna go from 222 to 184. So we need to subtract a total of 38 from 222 is equal to 184. So now what I need to do is I need to use 32 times to get to from basically 222 to 184. So that's a, that's a decrease of 1.1875. All we did is do 32 divided by 38 divided by 32 and then put a negative on that. So we're subtracting that each 32 intervals. And then blue is the same thing. We're going to go from 26 to 184. To get from 26 to 184, what do we have to do? Well, I have to increment the blue 4.9375 each time, each of the 32 times. So we do that here. 158, right? We need to, the difference is 158. So 158 divided by 32 is equal to 4.9. Three, two. So this is the interval difference. This is the interval difference. Now, if we're if we're going from gray to green, we're going to opposite. It's going to decrease. This is going to be increased. This is going to be decreased, and this is going to be decreased. The same numbers, just that we're opposite, increase or decrease. So that's how we do it inside the VBA code. And let's take a look at the VBA code and see how we did that in there. So remember, in this case, we're moving from green to gray, from green to gray in this section. Remember, it's currently true, so we're making it false. So the switch front, that is the shape that we're focused on. The four colors, the RGB, what is the RGB? This is the red here. This is the green right here, right here, and this is the blue right here. So it's based on the move button. So we're gonna all we're gonna do is use that number, that interval. Remember, it's starting out at zero, two twenty-two, twenty-six. That's where it currently is at. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add five point seven five times the move button, whatever this interval. This interval is gonna go from one to thirty-two in each loop. So each time we're doing the multiplication, each time we're adding a little bit more, a little bit more, 5.75 each time. So that's going to continue to increase that red, increase that red, and go all the way from 0 to 220, to 184, to 184. So each time it's going to go from, it's going to go 0 to 184. So we're going to do the same thing for red, except red we are minus, it's a subtraction. So we're going to subtract 185, 1.1875 times the move button. And then the blue, we're going to start out at 226, and then we're going to add 4.9375 times the move button. So what this is going to do is incrementally change the RGB of the shape. Every time for each of the 32 steps, it's changing it a little bit more, a little bit more closer to gray, from green to gray. So it gives it a really nice fade out effect. It's a really nice fit. Gives it. Let me let's select the shape so it runs a little bit slower, and you can see. So now incrementally, it's going to go from green to gray, and then from gray to green. And now on the gray, we just do the absolute opposite. Well, let's continue with our code. So it's going to go through this loop and change it. It's changing. It's not only is it moving it, it's changing the RGB background. It's kind of cool. It gives it a really nice fade effect. I want to make sure that if it moves to here. Let's, let's do that again. If this moves to here, what do I want to do? I want to make sure that when we move it from true to false, I want to, obviously we're changing the position, we're changing the color, but I also want to make sure it's particularly left of this. Wherever this shape is, wherever this is, I want to make sure it's just to the right of this end point here. So that way it ensures it. So this last part of the code is going to ensure that it's always left back. So it's going to be based on whatever this position is. This is called switch back. So based on wherever this position is, it's going to move into place. It's going to move into place automatically. So if I move it here, it's going to move automatically to that position. So that's really helpful, especially when we have certain positions. So it's always going to move. So we do that with one line of code. And it's always going to be based on the left and the top position, the left and the top position of this. In this case, just the left of the position, because the top position is regardless, regardless of whether it's left true or false, the top position is going to be the same. I'll go over that with you in a moment. So let's continue on. So what I want to do in this case, I want to make sure that the left position of the front, the shape left position, I want to ensure that it's in a certain place. Where do I want to place it? It's going to be based on the back left. Wherever this back 
point, wherever this back is, I want it to be exactly there plus 1.5, right? I don't want it to be exactly. If, if I remove this, let's just comment this out. If I keep it exactly, it's going to be identical. I don't want it exactly. I don't want it, I don't want it on top. You see, let's zoom in. I don't want it on top of the border like that that would be exactly so when we add 1.5 it moves it just a little bit to the right that's where i want it i want it right about there so which is actually 1.5 pixels a little bit to the right so that's how we do it so when we comment this out let's uncomment that out and let's take a quick back now when we move it there it's exactly right on there you see that right on there so that's how we get it to the exact left position based on the switch back the switch back so it's very, very, very helpful because especially when we're changing a lot of tabs and moving a lot of shapes around and, and you never know where you're going to end up, it's really important because things are easily to get moved around quickly uh, in the wrong positions, very easy. So we always want to make sure that when we change this, the only thing you don't want to do is if you increase this, it's going to really throw things off. So they're all based on, based on the width, based on the width of this back. So you would have to keep that in mind. All right moving on so we use this to confirm that it's going to be in the right position that helps without this sometimes it'll get in the wrong position this makes sure ensures that it is in the right left position else it's not reoccurring so else it would be currently gray then what would we do then well we set b167 to true setting the recurring to true and again we're going to do another we're going to do a loop here as well same thing 0 to 32 same weight now but this time we're going to increment left plus one plus one because we want it to move to the right 32 different times we're going to move it to the right and this time we're going to do exactly the same as we did here except this time we're subtracting here we increased and this we subtracted we here we increased the red here we're subtracting the red here we subtracted the green here we're increasing the green and here we increase the blue and here we're subtracting the blue so basically it always is going to go one direction or the other automatically based on the move button so it's a really nice little trick to math and uh, it's little trial and error to get these numbers exactly right but it's just math and so all we're doing is moving the colors and i want to see you guys use the fade out maybe you can use it for different i was also thinking about having the the back color border here the same color we could fade that too so i was thinking about that too you can do that as well change the border color is uh give that a fade that might be kind of nice all right so now we know how we fade it out and then when this one i want to also ensure the left position but this time it's going to be plus 35 plus 35 is going to give us exactly the plus position on the right so that's going to ensure that when we move this anywhere over here and we click on it it's going to move it right back to the exact right place and also i want the top position you notice that it's always in the right top position but we've only focused on the left well the top position is going to be used for either whether it's true or false whether it's always going to have the same so the top position we're going to change it we're going to control and set the top position automatically but that's regardless so this is if if it's true or false or false or true recurring or not recurring the top position is not going to change so that's why this is outside of the if else and if so the switch top is going to be the switch back plus 1.5 i don't want it exactly on the top i just want to move it a bit down from the back so that ensures that the switch is in the correct vertical position this ensures that the switch is in the correct horizontal position all right so now we know how we do this magical switch and let's take a look at the conditional formatting. You notice that when we turn it off, that dis everything disappears. Well, that's just conditional formatting. And we turn it on, it, it appears. And the same thing here. When it's inactive, we get gray font. When it's active, we get the black font. Let's uh, just highlight and take a look at the conditional formatting. Home and then conditional formatting and manage rules. We have three different rules. So we'll take a look at some of them. I think that uh, it's very, very simple. So we have the first one is the blue. So this is based on whether B167 is false, and that is the recurring. If recurring is true or false, that's what we're going to run. So we want blue, and what I want to do is I want to change the background to blue, all, and I want to change the font to blue, all. So And, of course, the borders, too, as well. So we're going to format that, and we'll see that the font has been changed to blue. We will see that the borders here are the left 
and the bottom and the right have all been removed. The top remains the same. And also we've given it a fill. So the fill and the font and the borders are, are the fill and the font are all the same colors. The borders have been removed. And that's going to give us this nice effect when it's false. What else do we have? Well, when G168 is inactive, what are we going to do? I want to format the font with this gray font here. I want to give it this gray font. And that will apply to cells E172 uh, through I172. And then also we have G168. These can be combined, actually. So we can combine these E178. 172 to I172. I think we can combine these. So we don't need all of that. And because it's the same rule, but sometimes when we copy and paste, we get duplicates like this. So we can paste that in here and use a comma and then just remove that since they're based on the same rule. Click apply and we have the same type of apply. So now when we make it inactive, we'll see that it changes to gray font. And when we make it active, it's going to change it to the black font. That's just based on whether G168 is active or inactive. Okay, great. So we understand the, the points here. And all this is is the data validation. So when we click data validation, we'll just see the two options, active and inactive. We have another data validation here. And this is the duration. It recurs every days, weeks, months, years. So I've added in five different ones. And that data validation is also here. When we click on the data validation, we can see that we have all five of those options here. You can add and remove though as you see fit. I want to, here's a frequency. This is just a whole number. The users can put in whatever they want every one day, every four weeks, every one month. So it's a really, really handy feature. And I'll show you in VBA how we turn that into actual days. We also want to know when the first import is going to run. That's important. You want to make sure that this first import. So let's say I'll just make it before since it's already passed so that we can run it. And now when we click check for reoccurring updates, it's going to automatically run a reoccurring update. And it's going to set. So now we've had it run. And if we look at this reoccurring, then we're on number two. And so it shows you the last run was on September 3rd. The next run would be April 9th in this case, although it's in back, but basically it gives you an idea. So we can also set it to, let's reset the date to, let's just do September 3rd. And uh, if we run it one month, we'll see, check for reoccurring. It's going to automatically run because it's past that. And you'll see the next uh, run automatically. If we look in reoccurring, it's going to be set for October 3rd, one month in advance from today. All right, so it shows you the current time it did run. All right, so you see how that's going to work. And we, we've gone over the data validation for both of these. We have uh, the date set. We've gone over, let's go into the VBA now and continue on with our macros. We now have in the reoccurring macro, we have the switch we just went over. We have the save. What I want to do is I want to make sure that any changes the user saves, since this section here is used for many different imports, I want to make sure that if a user changes this to two months, that that automatically gets changed here into the table. And if they change it to four months or four days, I want to make sure that that change automatically gets saved in our table database right here. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing I want to know is, has there been a, is this a brand new reoccurring? Has it ever been saved yet? In other words, is there, is there already an existing row? Well, we know that, we know the reoccurring number. We know it's reoccurring number two. But as long as this value it contains a value, it's not blank, we know it's an existing one. For example, if we were to change this to 25, we're going to see that this is blank because there is no match for the reoccurring number. So we know if the reoccurring number is blank, then we don't have it. So for example, as long as this has a value, we're going to have a row here, a value that's found, a recurring number that's found. We're going to have a row. So we can use that. We're going to make a change. So every time the user makes a change, we want something to happen. Well, what do we want to happen? Well, we wanted to either save it as a new one or update it. Let's take a look at that. And what do I want? I want active to go right here in column four. I want this import reoccurs. The frequency here, I want that to go in column five and the duration in column six, right? So I want that specific information automatically saved in, in a specific column. But how do we get that in there? Well, what we can do is we use data mapping, which you've seen me do before perhaps. And so if we know we want to put this in column four, we have to get column four. And what column are we on right now? Right now we're on column seven. 
So what if I, I want to store column four somewhere. I need to know, I know the row, it's going to go in row five. I know what row it's going in, but I got to know what column it goes in. So what I've done is I've stored this column right here, column four. And what, it, what did I store it? Equals column, I stored in column seven, six columns over. So six columns to the right, exactly six columns. One, two, three, four, five, six columns to the right, I've stored four. And if I need to know that this is going to go in column five, I have six columns over, I've put five. So I put the column number where it's going to be saved here. So let's say I need to say, okay, I've got to put active. I need to put it in row five, and I need to put it in column four, right? Row five, column four. Four. That's where it's going to go. That's where I need to put it. So as soon as I make a change to inactive, I have to know exactly where to put it. I have to know put it in row five, column four. So we know where we're getting five, but where are we going to get four from? We're going to get four from right here. We're going to look six columns over to the current row, and we're going to find the four right here. So that's how we find it. So let's take a look inside VBA and see exactly how we did that, how we transferred that information over to that. So inside the developers, Visual Basic, we're going to go, these are on sheet macros. The user's actually making a change on the sheet. So we have here on change of reoccurring import details, save in the database, but not on template load. What do I mean on template load? Well, when we're changing, when we're, when we're loading a template, I also want the changes to be loaded. So for example, if we change to template one and we look at the import summary, we see we have different details here. The other one was 10 o'clock. But if we change to template two, we also, now we have the details for this. There's different, right? There are different details. Every reoccurring import has different details. So when we're loading that information, when I'm bringing this information, bringing it all and bringing it into here, I want it to load up, but I don't, that change, that type of change, I don't want to, to do anything. Only when the user makes a change do I want to actually bring that change and put it over to here. So there's two types of changes, one when we load it and one when the user makes a change. So how do we differentiate between those two? Well, if you remember in the past training, we changed something, we changed something to true to false, and that would be up here. Let's go to tab one. We will see that we have something called template load in N6. So assume when we're loading the template, meaning when we're changing this automatically loading going through that macro, this value changes from false to true while the macro is running. And then as soon as the macro ends, it goes back to false. So when we're making a change, when the user makes a change here, we just need to make sure that N6 is false. So that's why we have it in the code. N6 must be false. In other words, not on template load, not on template load. That kind of change. So if there's a template load, then it's going to be ignored. So assuming that there is no template load, then we can go about saving those changes to the database, the ones that use, the user has made changes. Well, we do need to know two things. Remember, I need to know the reoccurring row, the row in which we're going to be, and I need to know the column. Those are the two things. In our tests right here, we had row five and column four. So we need to know those. And we need to put those into variables inside the code. So we need to define both of those as long. If B169 equals empty, then reoccurring save, what is that? That means it's a brand new. Why would it be new? Let's look at that. B169. If there's no row, remember, if it's blank, why would it be blank? It would be blank if there is no reoccurring number, right? If it's blank, then B169 would be empty. And in that case, this has never been saved before. So if I make a change, it's going to add a brand new one. If I make a change right here, it's going to add it. Look at that. See, now we have another one. Why? Because it didn't see it. So we can delete that. That was just for the test. So it didn't see that. So now when we change the recurring back to true, it's going to find it. So if it didn't see it, it's going to automatically add a brand new one. So that's a macro I'll go over with you in a minute. But let's assume for at this point that it is a currently saved one. For example, recurring number two is in row five. We know it's saved. So we want to save the changes that the user is making. So 
If it's blank, we're gonna run this macro, this macro reoccurring save. This, what it does is it saves a brand new line in here. It saves a brand new line right here. Next one would be row six. So that's what you just saw. So we'll go over that macro in just a moment. But what I wanna do is take you through the existing macro. So let's assume for now that uh, B169 is not empty and it's an existing. So here, as long, again, just to make sure we're gonna run it, it's not empty. If it's not empty and what? There's one other condition. I wanna make sure that when we look, when Excel looks to six columns over, one, two, six column, that there's a numeric value. If there's no numeric, if this is empty, it'll provide an error. So I wanna make sure that there's actually a whole number here, here, and here. So we're just gonna check that to make sure that number exists. And we can do that with this line of code, is numeric cells, the target row, means we're using the current row, and whatever the target column is plus six, that means six columns over to the right. If this value, whatever the value is in this cell, if as long as it's numeric is true, then we can continue on. That means it's a whole number. We just wanna make sure that prevents errors to make sure that there is a column number because it's the column number in this cell here. That's what we need to use. So moving on, if it is a column number, then we know the reoccurring row is in B169. The row, in this case, remember it was five, five right here, B169, five. We need the row and we also need the column, but where's the column? The column is in the next line of code. The reoccurring column equals cells, the target row, the target column plus six. That is the column of our resources. So that value would be either four, five, six, eight, or nine. So it'd be one of those two values, one of those, one of those of five values there it would be. So we would then, we, now that we have both the reoccurring column and the reoccurring cell, we don't need these two lines of code, there was a duplicate. So now we're ready. Now we ready to write our code to get it. Sheet six, sheet six is our reoccurring, reoccurring imports right here. That's the sheet we're saving in table two. That's the sheet I wanna put it on. Sheet six, cells. Why are we using cells and not range? We're using cells and not range because both of our column and our row are dynamic, especially column, row is fine. But it, when our column is dynamic, it's a whole number, we're gonna use cells. So the reoccurring row, the reoccurring row, column, this value, what does that value equal? Equals whatever the user just made the change, whatever the user made the change, target value. So that means as soon as the user makes a change, that value is going to be saved right here, 74, right here. That's how we do it. So we know the column, we know the row, so the change is very, very easy. All right, moving on. Next, now, if not intersect, if there's a change to G170, and B172 equals, then, and it's not empty, then what? Then I just wanna update this. This here is G170. If the user makes a change to this, what do I wanna do? I wanna take that and I wanna put the date right here because this date is gonna be based on this. So this date is gonna be based on the next. So as soon as the user change five, three, I want this date to be placed here into B172 as long as it's not blank because this date here is read by this. It's gonna combine the time and the date, the time here and the date here, gonna combine those and put a nice little text here. So we have that here. So that's what that line of code is. It takes this data and it puts it right into B172 as long as it's not blank. So if not intersects, if the user has made a change to G170 and the target value is not empty, then B172 equals the target value. And what that's gonna do is update the next import date. So that's what that line of code is. And that's it, that's end of. So that's how we make an update as long as there is an existing transaction. But what if it's new? What if it's saved? Remember, we didn't go over this macro. What if it's a brand new? What do we do then? Well, let's go in the reoccurring macros and take a look at that reoccurring save. This is the macro that we're gonna go over. Again, when we're saving it, we need, a, we need the reoccurring row, that's very important, and the reoccurring number. What is the number? Well, the number is gonna be consecutive. It's gonna go, in this case, it's one, two, the next one's gonna be three. But how do we get the next one? How do we know what the next one is? We can't duplicate them. We're gonna use our max. What is the maximum of these? And then we're gonna add one. Equals the max of recurring numbers 
The max, of course, is two, but what if we add one? That's going to get us three, and that's the next available one. So we do that just in the code right here. So we use our next reoccurring number in B170, and it's just that, the max of the reoccurring number plus one. But what if there's an error? Why would there be an error? Well, would there would be an error if there was no numbers here. So if there's no numbers here, if one and two are not here, what there would be an error, right? Because we're looking, so what is the max? So in this case, the max of the recurring would return an error. So if there's an error, I want it to show one, which is the first available no. So here you see the next recurring automatically changed to one because I removed the one and two here. So we'll put those back now. So it gives you an idea of why we have set that. So we know that the next recurring number is three. So I've got to define that in B170 and put that into a variable. So we do that, that's why we've defined the template number. And I want to make sure that there is an actual template. We can only save these. I need to make sure that there's actually a template that we're going to be running because the template's got to load automatically. How do we know that we're on a template? If we're cleared the template, right, we're not going to be able to, to save any reoccurring because there's no template to attach to. So we need to make sure that N3 has a value. N3 is cleared when no template is selected. But as soon as we select a template here, template 2, N3 takes on that template number right here. N3 takes on the template number. So we need to make sure that N3, if not, we're going to prompt the user, hey, make sure you save this as a template first before moving on. So we want to make sure that there's actually a template. If N4, N4 is the row, N4 is actually the row, That's we could use just as that as well. N4 here is the row. So as long as there's no row, it's a calculator, right? So if, if this is zero, N4 also is going to be blank. So that's important. N4 is blank, we could also use N3. If it's blank, then we know that it hasn't been used. We want to prompt the user, please save this as a template before making it reoccurring. Save it as a template. Then we're going to exit this up. So we want to make sure that, they're, that tell the user to please save it as a template first before we make it reoccurring. Okay, moving on. Assuming that it is recurring, we can now set the recurring number to that brand new value that we just saw, the max plus one. That's located in B170. That's going to set us our next recurring number. And the recurring row is going to be the first available row. What is the first? In this case, it would be six. So we're going to use end XLF to get us the last row. Plus one would be six. And so we do that in the code here. Sheet six, range A999, a large number, large cell. And XL up dot row plus one. This will get us the last row with a value. Adding one will give us the first available. So now we know the row we're going to put it in. And now we're going to set the created on the current date. I want to know when it was created. So we're going to set, that's just a one time thing. I 168 equals B 160 set the created on current date. So I want to set this date. We've got this. Created on date right here in 168. Let's set this back to import. So we're going to set I168 here. I want to set that to the created on date so we know when it was created. So we've got that. That's important so we know. And then next up we have A. Now we're going to fill in all the rows, not all of them, but, but many of them, all of the columns within our reoccurring. So we're going to set the ones that won't change. Reoccurring we're going to set. We're going to set template, we're going to set the created on, we're going to set probably a default status. We want to set the row number. These are going to be helpful when we actually run our advanced filter, and I'll show you that coming up probably next week because we're running out of time this week. So we're going to set all these values. A, let's, A of course, is our recurring number. B is going to be our template number, which is located in N3, B is our template number in N3. And then we have C, C is going to be our created on date equals B166. B166, that's the current date. Remember we had, I want to know that we could use B166, we could just easily use I, either one, they're both the created on date. And then we have F, F is going to be the adder update the interval. And I want to set that to whatever is in H169. Whatever is in H169, whatever is there, we're going to set that to automatic. If the user changes it, it'll be change it. And then we also want to set the time into I. I is going to give us the time. 
here is the here is I. I would be the time. I want to put whatever the user has, whatever set the default, whatever time. Maybe they're going to use the same time all the time. So we can set that to default, whatever is there. And then next up, we have the H. I want to set up the actual sent on. So we have that. What is that? This is the scheduled for. This is a combination of the next run on and next run at. So this is the formula. When we combine, when we add the next, I want to keep them separate here because I want to keep them separate here and here. But in our table, I want to combine them because that's going to be really helpful when we're running our macro to figure out which ones that need to be run. So when we combine them, H4 plus I4 or H5 plus I5, we combine them, we get a full date and time together. So I want to put the formula in there, and that's simply this, equals H and the record row, a recurring row, and plus I and the recurring row. So when we add those together, it creates the formula. Also, in K, we're going to create another formula called row. That's going to give us the row so that we always know the row. So when we run our advanced filter, the row follows up. So when we make changes to this, I know the original data, which in this case would be five, so that I can make those changes. So when I want to reset the last run or reset the run, I know what row to change it in. So that's going to be helpful. So that's, and then I want to run the calculate just to make sure that all the, these formulas are calculated automatically because we're going to need them right away. B168, we're going to set that to the recurring number. That's Now that we've created a brand new one, I want, to, I want to set the current one to the recurring one. What does that do here? So that automatically sets, puts this in B168, puts the current recurring number right here. So that way the row gets automatic, the new row gets automatically calculated. And that is exactly how we save the information. That's how we save the information. Recurring save. So we've got it all saved here and everything. So now we're ready. So we only need to do this on original saves. After that, any change we make, all the updates are just get created. All these updates are automatically created. So anytime the user makes a change to this, it's just going to get automated. We don't have to add in all these information and we just have to add in only the change information that the user creates. And so we can also use data mapping here. We've done that. We also have conditional formatting. If you see here, automatically when we make changes, it's automatically conditional formatting. Let's take a quick look at that and see what kind of conditional formatting we've set up for this nice table. We go into the conditional formatting and manage rules. We've got two different rules here, both based on conditions. If we edit the rule, if A4 does not equal blank and notice there's no absolute, no dollar sign below between 4 and that before 4, and that means it's going to be for every subsequent row wherever it's been applied to. And what kind of format are we doing? We're going to add a border, and I want to add these left and right green borders. That gives the tables a nice look. So I want to do that. We can also add additional borders here if we want to, just by clicking here and clicking OK and applying, and that's going to give us a, a border if we want, but it's only going to apply to rows in which column A contains a value. And the next up, I want to color alternate rows, just like in tables. When you add tables, I want to do this dynamically by add coloring the even rows. So how do we do that? If you'll notice, even rows get colored a different color. So rows 8 get, get that green color. So how do we do that? Back into the conditional formatting and then manage the rules. And we can take a look at this conditional formatting. There's two conditions here. And so because there's two specific conditions. A4, notice that again there's no dollar sign between for the four, and that makes sure that it's not absolute. While the column is absolute, the row is not absolute. As long as that does not equal blank, and the mod row two equals zero. That means even rows, only for even rows we want this to apply. And what do we want to apply? Well, it's a simple fill format, and that's just the green color. I've given it this green color right here so that gives it a nice green color just more colors and giving it a light green and that's how we give the alternating rows this nice color here so that's as and that's as soon as we add information in column a so it's really really helpful all right next week what we're going to cover we're going to cover data mapping we're going to cover how to do the reoccurring and how to create these reoccurring automatically we're also going to set it up so we show you how your computer you can launch this application automatically at scheduled interviews and launch these so that you can automatically create imports simply by without having to click this reoccurring imports right now when we click it sure we're going to get an import 
automatically and that's going to happen for whether it's a dynamic source or whether in this case it is a static source so it's working just great now if you want to take a look at it make sure you get your download make sure you add in your own source files okay this is not going to work these are mapped to my computer not yours so you want to make sure that you use your own tests and your own folders if you do notice any bugs let me know and i'll make sure to fix them because next week is part 10 so i want to make sure to get all of the issues worked out so it gets you a complete application working great i'd love to see and hear how you're going to do it so make sure you comment and let me know what you think and if you like this training series part 10 is going to be the last one we're going to cover the reoccurring automation and that'll do it so thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next week have a great one